ever since people have been lending money to each other, there's been one fundamental problem. What happens when someone can't pay back their debts? Can't pay back. What are you going to do? And before I really jump into what we do now in our modern society, let's get a couple of the uh, words out of the way that we're going to use a lot. And these are words that you'll hear a lot in the context of debt or in the context of loans. So on one side of the transaction, you have the debtor. And this is essentially the person that borrowed the money. Borrowed money. And because they borrowed the money, they now owe money. So you could either say they borrowed the money or that they owe money. They owe the money. On the other side of the transaction, you have the creditor. Creditor. This is the entity or the person that is owed the money, or they lent the money to the borrower. So they lend the money. They lend the money. So we have our words out of the way, but let's go back to our fundamental question. What happens when the debtor can't pay the creditor back the money that the creditor is apparently due? Well, you know, if we go back through the through through human history, they've come up with re, you know various solutions to this to this problem. We can call it. If you go back to ancient Greece, ancient Greece, they had a very simple solution to it. The debtor, if the debtor can't pay back their debts, will then become a debt slave to the creditor. So they became a debt slave. So if the creditor needs some gardening done or would like uh, his or her house cleaned more regularly, the debtor, and actually probably the debtor's family, would have then had to do whatever the creditor wanted until they essentially pay back their debt through their labor. So that's how Greece handled it. it you know, it's, it's kind of shocking to us now, but that was their solution. You decided to borrow money. You can't pay it anymore. This is what you got to do. Now, if we, if we fast forward a little bit, to maybe medieval Europe, and this is, you know, this is even uh, uh, Charles Dickens' father was even uh, uh, caught into this into this kind of a bind. But until kind of the early or mid 1800s in Europe and the United States, you had the notion of debtors' prison. Debtors' prison. And frankly, I, you know, when I describe this to you, you'll find that it's even worse in my mind than being a debt slave in debtors' prison. They would throw you in jail. So they would throw you, they would imprison you, and that's why it's called debtor's prison, and you're not coming out until your family pays off your debt. Your family, or your, maybe your friends, if you have good friends, pays off your debt. Off your debt. And I mean, you know, just thinking about why this is especially horrible, at least here you had your chance to work off your debt. Here, if your family, uh, either you know, if it, w my situation right now, you know, if, if I get thrown in prison, will my 10-month-old son be able to pay off my debt? No, I'm just going to rot in prison forever. Or what if my family doesn't like me? Or what if uh, I have no family or friends? Just for you know, I might have owed someone the equivalent of now of a thousand bucks, and because of that, I could serve a life sentence in prison. So uh, you can imagine that debtor's prison could be could be quite harsh. And actually, Charles Dickens' dad was in debtor's prison. So it's, it's, uh, it can kind of tell you a little bit about why he writes the type of books that he does. But anyway, this is the past. We are now a civilized society. And hopefully, we have a better way of dealing with the situation when a debtor owes a creditor money. And that's the topic of this video. And so now, what we do is something called bankruptcy. And just so you know, the first versions of bankruptcy weren't that different from debtor's prison. They were actually more to protect the creditor than to protect the debtor. But now we have bankruptcy laws, and for the most part, they're to prevent this type of craziness or for someone to spend their entire life on kind of this uh, wacky debt treadmill. So let's talk a little bit about bankruptcy. And I'm going to focus on bankruptcy as it is in the United States. So let me write down bankruptcy in a new color. Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. And it's going to have a U.S. focus. And in general, I'm going to talk about personal bankruptcy. Although it, a lot of what I talk about, on some level, applies to corporations as well. And I've actually made videos on that as well. So let's say I'm just overwhelmed with debt. I've I have you know a hundred thousand dollars of credit card loans. Uh, I I uh, have a, a mortgage to pay. I have a, a a car lease that was a little bit over my head. What can I do? So there's a couple of options in the United States. 
You have chapter 7. It seems very complicated. These are all ch different, literally, chapters of the bankruptcy code. So you have chapter 7. This is called a straight bankruptcy. And this is literally, you go, I mean, it's not a, a simple procedure, but the gist of it is you go to the bankruptcy courts, you say, look, I can't pay back my debts. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take my assets, and then whatever, whatever there is there, they're going to split it amongst the, my creditors. And then after all is said and done, I don't owe anyone anything, although I've lost a lot of my assets. Some of them are exempt. They let you keep things that you need to live, like your, your pots and pans, and uh, maybe one television, and maybe a suit so that you can find a job. But if I have a bank account, I probably don't, because I uh, got so deep into debt. But if I have some money, if I have a, a, a nice a diamond ring or, or, or a Rolex watch, they're going to take that from me. And they're gonna, the trustee, the bankruptcy court, is going to take that from me, sell it, and then give it to all my creditors. But at the end of the day, after all is said and done, I'll actually be free of all of my debt. So you can, you, it, it's kind of a way to break from this cycle of always owing money and always just barely making it or probably not making it at all. So that's a straight bankruptcy. And you might say, well, why doesn't everyone do that who's you know, under, under a big, heavy load of debt? Well, one, there's a lot of rules that make this easier and not so easy to do. But the other thing is it stays on your credit report for 10 years. 10 years on credit report. So you got to think to yourself, am I going to be better off over the next 10 years uh, continuing to pay off my debt? If I can pay off my debt, if I have any chance, I should probably do that so that I don't ruin my credit for the next 10 years. But if it's just a hopeless situation, I might as well do it. And just so you know, this isn't a cure for everything. If you've got, you know, if you're sitting on $300,000 of student loans, I say, wow, well, you know, let me just, that's going to take me more than 10 years to pay anyway. Let me just declare Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Uh, it'll be unfortunate to find out that student loans are not, cannot be forgiven in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And so there's a whole set of uh, types of loans, or I guess you could say types of liabilities, things you owe to other people that cannot be forgiven. Certain types of ta taxes, student loans, uh, child support, those won't be forgiven. So this you know, this will definitely apply to things maybe like credit card loans. But this isn't just a very, very simple process. So any of these things that I talk about, you definitely want to uh, consult uh, an expert on your kind of particular situation to get a little bit more detail. But this is just an overview. So that's chapter 7, straight up bankruptcy. I, I don't have what it takes to keep servicing my debt. I want a brand new start. Now, the next one, or the next one that you're going to be most you're going to hear the most about in the context of a personal bankruptcy is chapter 13. Chapter 13. And this is often referred to as a reorganization. Reorganization. And here is the idea is, look, I have a salary, I have a job, but I just have more debt than is imaginable. And it might not be just because I've been irresponsible. Maybe a, a medical emergency came up in the family, or I had some unknown expenses that just popped up out of nowhere. And so here the situation is, look, uh, Mr. Creditors out there, I really do want to pay you back. But what you're asking for me to do right now is just crazy. If you, if you ask me to do that, I'm just going to end up in Chapter 7 eventually. So for both my sake, for me, as the, me as the debtor, both for my sake and for your sake, why don't we come up with a plan so that I can realistically so that I can realistically pay you over the next three to five years? And that might involve you saying, hey, instead of Instead of being owed 50000 you now owe me 40000 Or instead of the interest on my credit card being 20% per year, let's change that to 10% a year. So there'll be a little bit of a negotiation. You're going to have to come up with a plan. And then once you come up with that plan, I've got to pay that over the next three to five years. Three to five years. Now, once again, you might say, "Hey, well, that's pretty good. You know, if I owe a hundred thousand dollars in credit card debt, and you know, and I kind of go to my creditors and and make a you know and 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 look like a genuine individual and make a nice sob story, they're going to uh, lower my debt. I'll be better off than if I didn't do it. But here again, there's a you know there's a penalty to doing it, and and once again, it shows up on your credit report. And so, in general, you're gonna, they're going to come up with a plan for you to pay back your creditors over three years. And then after that, it's going to show up on your credit report for another seven years. Seven years on credit, 
on your credit report. So in general, from the time you file until the time it leaves your credit report, it's going to be 10 years, just like, just like chapter 7. So in either of these situations, these aren't things that you want to just jump into and, and think, wow, I've, I found an easy out uh, from my debt. These are very serious things that will impact you for a, you know, a, a reasonable chunk of, 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 uh, uh, of your life. So these aren't just simple things to do. But they are good to know about, just in case you do find yourself a little bit uh, over your head or a little bit underwater, or you know someone who's in this situation. At least it, it is an out where they can feel that, look, if I do this or that, maybe over the next next uh, either three years or 10 years, depending on how you view it, they can uh, get to a new start. And just so you have a sense of how often this occurs, I looked this up a little bit earlier. In the US, in the US, and as you can imagine, we're in the middle of a recession now, so bankruptcy filings are kind of uh, going through the roof. So let me write this down. So this is chapter 7. Chapter 7, and here's chapter 13. And if you're wondering what are all the chapters in between, there's a chapter 12, which is essentially chapter 13 for farmers and fishermen. They get a few more benefits than the, than the rest of us get, just because we want to promote, I guess, people who produce food. And then there's chapter 11, which is uh, essentially business reorganization. It can apply to some individuals who uh, are essentially kind of big shots, who you know their, their personal portfolios of assets and liabilities look a lot like a, a business. So for them, chapter 11 will be more appropriate than chapter Chapter 13. Uh, so that those are kind of the two other chapters. But from a personal bankruptcy point of view, uh, Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 are what is what most people concern themselves with. Now, just to give you the numbers of how often this is occurring, just you know, if you find yourself in this circumstance, just so you know you're not necessarily alone, and also just to see that they really are increasing right now. So 2007, 2008, 2000. Nine. So chapter 7 filings in the United States in 2007, 413,000. In 2008, it went up to 560,000. So this is a more than a 25% increase. And then in 2009, 819,000 filings, essentially double of the, the number of chapter 7 filings in 2007. And if you look at chapter 13, in 2007, we had 277,000 filings. So for every two chapter sevens, there looks like there's about, well, for every four, there's about three of these. Then we have 334,000 in 2008, and then 370,000 in 2009. So you can see that the chapter seven ones are, I mean, they're both increasing really fast, but chapter seven is even more dramatic. And you can imagine, because uh, in a situation where people don't have jobs, chapter 13 really isn't that viable of an option. They really have to do something like chapter seven. Anyway, hopefully you found that useful and you know a little bit about bankruptcy now.